I know, I know. Most of you subscribe to me for Assassin's Creed, and if I stop stabbing Templars with a hidden blade for two seconds, if I stop stabbing targets with an edged weapon for two seconds, woe and terror be upon me. I get it, I understand, you know, I just like to have fun sometimes too. Hades is a $20 early access release by Supergiant Games. If you have no idea who that is, they made Bastion, Transistor, and Pyre. Ooh, sexy art style and juicy visuals, yes. Their games are known for having emotional and gripping narratives about humanity, freedom, love, loss, and the reasons we fight at the end of the day. So when Supergiant announced Hades at the Game Awards, I was a little concerned. Hades is a roguelike, and roguelikes are a genre that generally fails to tell a compelling story. They're not the kind of game you'd play if you want an enjoyable narrative. The very nature of the genre itself seems to clash with everything Supergiant values and is known for. It was bound to be a mess, the first Supergiant game to fail to do what it set out to. Naturally, this made me purchase it immediately, because I get no greater hit of dopamine and adrenaline than supporting games that can't possibly work, no matter how much effort goes into them. And it turns out that Hades is actually really cool, and the best 20 bucks I've spent in a long time. I did mention that it was a roguelike, which is a genre of game in which you lose your progress every single time you die, and on your next respawn, the entire game world is shifted around. There are permanent upgrades that are forever bolted onto your character, and some people call games that have this feature rogue lights, but if you're going to be that pedantic about something like that, then you probably shouldn't watch too many of my videos, because I'll be pissing you off on a regular basis. These permanent upgrades are an external way you get better at the game, as you're a little bit stronger every time you respawn, which means you'll get a little bit farther, and they make learning the game internally in your mind way more bearable, as dying still gives you something to look forward to, and runs are never a complete waste, no matter how badly you do. Roguelikes test understanding and knowledge of a game's systems and mechanics, and they test memory too, but in a very different way than most games. You're not tested on whether you can react to exact layouts of enemies that you've bashed your head against three respawns in a row, you're tested on whether you're adaptable, and whether you've memorized the appropriate responses to different situations, while using different tools. In a roguelike, you need to be ready for the game to throw conceivably anything it wants at you, and you've got to have the fortitude and cool to come out on top. The random nature of the levels on each life and the scrambled upgrades your character gets every time you start a new run means that there is an amount of luck that you have to ride and manage, because you can't ever truly guarantee getting exactly what you want, so you end up getting very skilled at working with what you happen to have. If your brain's been getting itchy looking at the footage in the background because it looks kind of familiar to other games you've played, it's because of the particular kind of roguelike Supergiant have made, a dungeon crawler. You know, like Victor Vren or Path of Exile, a kind of top-down isometric view, Supergiant's favorite thing, and lots of monsters with health bars to left-click on until they die. I must have left one out there. Ah yes, the poster boy of the dungeon crawler genre, which has recently met with a bit of a terrible fate, hasn't it? Whereas Blizzard are over in their little bubble pulling shit like this. Goodness. Is there any plans to make this playable on PC? Uh, we don't have any plans at the moment to do uh, PC. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that, all have phones. Phone. Supergiant are over here going, hold my ambrosia. If you've ever wondered what Diablo made by the Bastion and Transistor guys would feel like, Hades is remarkably close. Hell, they even share a similar naming convention. Sort of. Diablo is effectively the king of hell, and Hades is the king of, uh, Hades. Yeah, how'd you like that one? The story of Hades, and yes, you heard that right, is about the prince of the underworld, Zagreus, who's trying to escape the realm of his father Hades for any number of personal reasons which I won't spoil. Zagreus's voice acting is top-notch, which is great because, as your player character, you'll be hearing him talk more than anyone else. Some of us more than others. He sounds so much like Alucard from the Netflix Castlevania series that I actually had to make sure James Callis wasn't voicing him. It's actually Supergiant Games' amazing composer, Darren Korb. It turns out also that the particular storytelling style that Supergiant have got going on doesn't need that much bending and breaking in order to fit the roguelike genre, and in some ways it actually makes the agonizing experience of dying over and over again much more bearable. I don't like roguelikes very much as a rule, though like any good rule there are a few lovely exceptions. Hades is absolutely one of those. 
Each time you die, there is a chance that you can have optional conversations with the various inhabitants of the House of Hades, and if you reach certain characters in Tartarus or Asphodel, with them too. The dialogue is as well written as you can expect from this developer by now, and every single piece of it is voice acted. I played this early access build for about 35 hours, before getting a single line of meaningful repeating dialogue that's more than just a voice bark. That's... that's kinda cool. As you keep playing and having these conversations, you learn a lot about the underworld, about Zagreus and the relationships he has with the different characters. A bitter ex-girlfriend of his, for example, is constantly at his throat or alternatively wants nothing to do with him because she's one of the underworld's guardians charged with keeping souls from escaping, and he's constantly trying to get out. His life's purpose, his driving goal, puts him at odds with her and strains their connection. Likewise, his bond with his father is even worse. Hades neglects Zag and has a total lack of faith or belief in him of any kind. He might as well be trash the big H-man sees out of the corner of his eye. While Hades doesn't harm Zag directly in any way, the utter void of any kind of support for his own son is an extreme display of neglect, and last time I checked, that is abuse. So there's a lot of that going on. Super giant games, everybody. Looking at the difficult issues in a game that's fun to click demons to death in. And oh, is it fun to click demons to death in. Attacks feel crunchy and have impact, those sexy little damage numbers pop and bounce like the numerical equivalent of blood and gore. Enemies flash and take hitstun on every attack that connects, and when you deplete a foe's HP to zero, they dissolve in a satisfying animation that just has you feeling pumped up and ready to take down the next one. While the game is very responsive, each action you take also has to be very deliberate. You can't just go charging in willy-nilly and start spitting out animation after animation, because you have recovery frames and delay after every single action. Powerful ones are the most useful ones, coming with a much greater recovery lag than ones with less impact. So when you swipe with a sword once or twice, you can pretty quickly move out of that. But try to do your sword's third hit, and you'll be stuck there for a little longer. The same applies to your dash, which is an amazing move for getting out of a sticky situation or engaging a distant enemy with a dash attack, but not so great if you dash into trouble and then can't leave for a few moments. To say nothing of the special AoE that you use as the sword's secondary attack. Scary stuff, those recovery frames. You might want to buff that one, super giant. And speaking of secondary attacks, Zagreus has also got the ability to cast these blood crystals at his opposition, which deal a whopping 40 damage at baseline and can be upgraded depending on the random drops you get throughout a run. When a crystal hits an enemy, it'll be lodged inside their body until some time passes, or until you carve it back out of his corpse by slaughtering him. This incentivizes you to prioritize enemies you've already hit with your ranged ability, both because they're already weakened from your prior damage, and because killing them will let you cast your crystal at others. And all of this is just the basics, it gets much more complex than this. When you first start out, you'll be locked at just one crystal, but you can upgrade your cast capacity up to four by spending darkness at the Mirror of Night in Zag's room. This isn't the only upgrade you can get from the mirror, and there's quite a number of permanent upgrades you can invest in here that you get to keep forever from run to run, as long as you have the requisite amount of darkness to unlock it, which you can think of as XP, an upgrade is yours is yours is yours, and nothing can take it away from you. More serious upgrades require keys in order to unlock, and you can find these throughout the many rooms of the underworld. Keys also unlock additional weapons for Zack to use, a spear, a bow, and even a shield, and each one of these plays completely differently from the sword and from each other. Picking one weapon over another at the start of every run is a legitimate choice, because you might be much more used to one than another, you might want to train with a different one so you fight with it more comfortably, and sometimes it's just nice to switch things up for the variety. Did I mention that the goddamn training dummy is a character in his own right, and he's absolutely hilarious? Come on, boyo, let's gab him more stabbing over here. There's a whole little substory about who exactly hired this guy to sit around here taking hits from you until you pummel him into dust before he respawns and asks for it in the face all over again. He's also voiced by Darren, the same actor who voices Zagreus. Is there anything this guy can't do, seriously? The game drips this kind of charm at every second corner, and it's something that greatly lightens the emotional burden of getting demolished by whatever nameless baddie destroyed you this time. And when I say nameless, I mean that purely rhetorically. Every enemy character and boss has got its own codex entry that you can read all about and unlock more by killing them a bunch. The cleaning lady who looks after everything is an anxious mess of a gorgon named Dusa, who's constantly crushing on Zag. Get it? Maid Dusa? 
That one took me a moment. Half of the characters are these serious badasses, and the other half are precious goofballs that you can't help but grin at every time you talk to them. To say nothing of the pantheon of gods you'll meet on the battlefields of the underworld. Every once in a while you can pick up a god's token, and they'll appear to say a little something to you, which gives them some much appreciated characterization, but also gives you the choice of three random upgrades drawn from a pool associated with that same god. Artemis might give you crit chance, or lets your ranged cast attacks home in on enemies. Athena is very defensive and helps you protect yourself, while Poseidon gives a ton of crowd control, and Aphrodite is all about weakening enemies so they hurt you less but you hurt them more. And each of these has got their own voice with their own style. Poseidon is the cool uncle. Hades, you recognize your uncle, do you not? We have a lot of catching up to do, but first things first, you get yourself out of that dour underworld. Aphrodite is always flirting with you, and Artemis is just as exasperated with her realm as Zag is with his. Sisyphus is in the game, and he's goddamn hilarious as well. He named his rock. He's been stuck with this friggin' boulder for such a lengthy eternity that he gave it a name. Charon is the boatman of the River Styx as we know, and he's basically an incoherent zombie incapable of any real speech, but the way Zag reacts to his meaningless groans every time makes their every interaction priceless. I love this game. The kinds of upgrades you'll find throughout a run combined with the weapon you've put them on and the persistent benefits you've received from the Mirror of Night will define your playstyle for the current life, and learning what the different effects do and how you can play with each one most effectively is a large bulk of the meaningful gameplay. As you get a better understanding of what everything does, which upgrades work for you and which ones feel underwhelming and you want to avoid, the underworld begins to have less and less power over you. Whatever it decides to put you up against is easier to overcome, when the mental database you've built already contains the best strategies on how to defeat it. Now, we can't none of us be perfect, and the same is true of Supergiant's brawly dungeon crawly, so it would be a bit disingenuous if I just told you everything I loved without mentioning some things you should be aware of before you buy it. The game is in early access, which means it's not finished. Sure, it's a very agile, quickly developing game, with patches every day or two and major updates even having their own countdown timer on the main menu. It's kind of awesome to log in and glance at the corner in the bottom right only to see that oh, we're about a month away from completely new content. And yeah, the devs are responsive to bugs you report, but even with all that in mind, the game only has two major levels with about 13 or so rooms in each of them for a total of 27 chambers. Because it only has two levels, the latter one, Asphodel, feels a little overtuned in terms of difficulty at the moment, and its boss battle is excessively challenging and a major difficulty spike from the Tartarus region preceding it. The only way this makes sense is when you remember that because the game only has two regions right now, this is effectively the final boss. Put in that context, it's a little easier to accept, but it's always tough to shake the feeling that unless you get the right boons per run, either the Hydra or certain regions of Asphodel are unbeatable no matter what you do. That's another thing. The game currently has power distribution that's a bit all over the place. Sword is the weakest weapon, although it's the one you start with, not just because of its low damage numbers and extremely risky special ability, but also because it's just the hardest to use across the board. Every other weapon allows you a certain degree of safety in certain situations where you can just back off and play risk-free until you see a good opening to jump in and go ham. With sword lacking any kind of ranged ability attached to the weapon itself, you're left with just your cast, which is also not readily available if you've lodged all four of your crystals into some monster's tummy. There's a certain low-level mini-boss that has a power spike so massive compared to the rest of the region it's placed in that it will probably kill you and feel very unfair until you realize that armored enemies do not take hit stun and can't be crowd controlled the same way enemies lacking armor can be. And once you do realize that, it'll still feel unfair, you'll just know why it feels unfair. If you lack the appropriate level of boons or damage numbers in order to challenge it, you can fight this miniboss for minutes on end, until it either kills you or you finally kill it, with some lives lost or most of your health gone. It's just aggravating to experience this in a region whose difficulty is otherwise perfect for it being the first one the player fights through. So far, I've spent about 40 hours in this game, and I've unlocked nearly every permanent upgrade that's currently available to unlock. That's about 50 cents per hour, I think. I will likely play this game for many more hours to come, not for the sake of any progression, but just because it's enjoyable to play and click on stuff in, and it already has a community that's very fun to engage with and be part of. While I know I personally don't regret my purchase, I can't tell you objectively whether this game is worth the asking price. That'll probably change, however, when the next major update rolls around. And like Zagreus and his burning will to claw his way out of hell, 
that gets a little closer every day.